welcome everyone to our online experience. Thanks for joining us. And by the way, thanks for all of you that text and email me uh, with very inspiring, encouraging words uh, that I read on the way home or late at night. We hope you do enjoy your online experience. We think in church is, is the proper experience, but when you're traveling or under the weather, we realize at home, um, is it an effective tool. So thanks for letting us into your home. In a few minutes, you're gonna see some uh, videos that will tell you about our church and the online experience. So once again, enjoy the service. everyone I want to talk to you for just a few minutes about what we're calling our open doors campaign if you track with us here at CC Delco you've probably heard me already talk about this but God has given us a grand vision for the next five to seven years a vibrant ministry that he wants to do uh, some of it's a continuation of what we already do in an expanded form some of them are new launches it's gonna require more space here on our beautiful 22 acres so we know some of you don't reside here but you really enjoy the ministry we do or we know some of you travel or have homes elsewhere. So what we'd love to do is send you uh, this brochure. Uh, it could actually be viewed online. We have an Open Doors campaign landing page where you can read all about the campaign. And uh, we'd love to send this to you. We'd love you to be a part of what God's doing here. Uh, these are great times here. Um, we believe where God guides, He provides. So we ask that you might be generous towards what we do. And we're gonna pray that God blesses you in return. Thanks. Ben, welcome to the table, our full service coffee bar and scratch kitchen. So, why do we have a restaurant and a church? Why do we take great care to have extremely accurate weight when we're making a cappuccino? Why do we have a full service kitchen where we scratch make all of our food? It's all about community. It's about the people coming in, relaxing, hanging out, kids are running around playing, and what can't happen in the sanctuary, which is one-on-one, -on -one, where people are just interacting and talking and chatting and laughing, happens in here at the table. And so that's why we go to such great lengths to take extreme care into what we're preparing for the customer. Because it's all about the customer. It's all about making their day a little bit better. This is a third space. It's a space where they're not at home, they're not at work, they're at a place where they relax, hang out, their kids can run around and they just have a great time. And we want to make sure that the time that they have here at the table is really, really special by making them amazing coffee and amazing food.
then we serve it up. That's what we do and why we do it at the table. Hey guys, I'm Anna Walker Roberts. If you've met me before, you know that I'm incredibly passionate about sharing the gospel. One of the ways that I get to do that on a very regular basis is through the story. This is our church's coffee shop and bookstore that's located in Ardmore, Pennsylvania. Many of you haven't made the hike over there, and so I wanna show you a little bit about what it is. We are a coffee shop and a bookstore that's located in Ardmore, Pennsylvania, all the way on the other side of Delaware County from the main campus of our church. We're present over there because we want to engage with young adults and with college students who are in that region who may not otherwise find a connection to our church. At The Story, we sell coffee, we sell books, we also host all kinds of ministry events, do evangelism, have Bible studies, monthly concerts where we get to share the gospel, a film series where people can talk through what it is that they believe. We're looking for ways to be part of the social fabric of the community and invite the community in to the fabric of who God is. Our church financially supports the story, and so thank you if you're part of that. We also want to invite you to come check it out. Come see what God is doing on the other side of the county. You can check out our website as well and give us a follow on Instagram or Facebook if you want to stay in touch with what we're doing. But we hope that your story can connect with our story at The Story.
Welcome here. My name is Shem. And along with this team, please join us as we worship God. Lift our voices to Him. Yeah. The Lord is great and greatly to be praised. His name is a strong tower that the righteous run into and find shelter. So if you're looking for shelter today, I am. If you're looking for shelter, we are created to be sheltered by the Lord Himself. So let's, let's sing His name this morning.
was a wretch I remember who I was I was lost I was blind I was running out of time Sin separated The breach was far too wide But from the far side of the chasm You held me in your side So you made a way Across the great divide Left behind heaven's throne To build it here inside And there at the cross You paid the debt I owe Broke my chains, freed my soul For the first time I had hope Thank you 
says that we come to God with our hearts sprinkled clean with a clear conscience. The blood of Jesus Christ avails for us even today. It just didn't happen 2,000 years ago and it was one and done. We're told that the Lord took it to the heavenly tabernacle and it speaks for us today. Just a brief testimony, I was, I was driving here. We live in such a world filled with fear, it's crazy. And I'm saying that because I, I deal with it too. And I made this turn and the thought about Jesus sleeping in a boat came to me. You know the story, they were being tempest tossed and Jesus was asleep in a boat that was bouncing up and down like crazy. And the Lord impressed upon me. He's like, Shem, your fears, I live in you. I'm not shaken. I'm not shaken. So don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. It so encouraged me. Because the power that raised Jesus from the dead actually lives within us, Ephesians tells us. And Paul prays that we might know, we might have wisdom, be given wisdom and revelation to discover these things. And so that led, that led me to repentance, repentance over my own unbelief, repentance over fear, which is a lack of trust for me. That God lives in me. The God who lives in you is unshakable. He's not shaken and even when we are shaken. He is our help. He is our help. And even if it feels like he's asleep, sometimes it does feel like he's asleep. He's not. You, the vessel, will get to his desired destination. Let's remember that. So as we sing, let's declare that the Lord is my help. I will lift up my eyes to the hills From whence cometh my help My help cometh from the Lord The Lord which made heaven and earth He said He will not suffer thy foot Thy foot to be moved the Lord which keepeth thee, he will not slumber nor sleep. Oh, the Lord is thy keeper, the Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. Sun shall not smite thee by day, nor the moon by night. He shall preserve thy soul, even forevermore.
good. Hey, we're going to receive our offering this morning. There's way to get, ways to give up on the screen. The ushers will come forward now. And uh, as we do that, I want us to rejoice in the God who is our Savior, who is our firm foundation. This song demands the clapping of hands. The drums are not enough. The clapping of the hands. Let's sing victory in Jesus. Let's just keep it like that and sing. I heard an old, old story. someone next to you before you sit down and take a look at the screen. Taylor and I am back with another monthly video announcement. 
So let's take a look at all that's getting highlighted for the month of April. First up, we are hosting our third annual golf outing as a fundraiser for Innovate Academy, our pre-K through eighth grade classical Christian school. Join us on Monday, April 22nd at Penn Oaks Golf Club for an incredible time of fellowship and competition as we play a golf shamble. Your registration will include the round, catered lunch, and prizes. So make sure you register yourself and your team at ccdelco.com slash events and don't miss out on this incredible day of fundraising. Next, our men's ministries Friday Night Fires are back for another round of food, fellowship, hearing some awesome testimonies, and of course, sitting by a great fire. The first one is on Friday, April 12th from 6 to 10 p.m. at the Freedom House in Thornton, PA. And these monthly events will occur typically on the second Friday of each month. Next, we are thrilled to host a one-day event with Doug Axe on artificial intelligence or AI on Saturday, April 27th from 9 to 12 p.m. Some of us are skeptical, worried, or just indifferent about the emerging technology of AI. And so this workshop is going to explore the practical and philosophical implications of AI, as well as equip believers in this new age of technology. Doug received his PhD from Caltech, is a molecular biology professor at Biola University, and is the author of Undeniable, how biology confirms our intuition that life is designed. So you are in good hands. The Table Cafe will open at 8 a.m. for breakfast, and our program will start promptly at 9 a.m. So head to ccdelco.com slash events and register so we can know how many to expect. Now I know we just entered spring, but for these next few events, we're gonna look ahead to summertime. Next, we are bringing back summer camps at Calvary, a day camp where your kids will learn various skills, get discipled in a safe environment, all at an affordable cost. We are offering four different camps this year, an arts and crafts camp, a basketball camp, the way worship camp, and a theater camp. Each camp has their own cost, schedule, and age ranges. And you can sign up for one week or multiple weeks of various camps. So grab a brochure in the atrium and get all the details about each camp and then register your child to secure them an awesome summer. And next, our J Kids Ministry is excited to announce the return of VBS. This year's theme is Start the Party, where we believe that Jesus gives us the most amazing reason to party and that his love and the gospel is the best news ever. So join us for fun, games, amazing worship, incredible Bible truths, and imagine the entire church covered in disco balls. So save the dates of July 22nd to 25th for your kindergarten through fifth grader. And registration is open for the best week ever. And finally, as the weather starts to warm up, you know what that means. Sizzle and Summer is right around the corner. If this is your first summer with us, Sizzle and Summer is an amazing chance for us to fellowship and do church outside. You can expect a festival style food court, worshiping under the stars, hearing from some of the best teachers, speakers, and artists right here on our lawn, and the best part of all, baptisms. And with all that said, we need your help to pull this off. We'll need well over 70 volunteers to help with things like running the food court, selling merch, being on the prayer team, helping with setup and tear down, and much, much more. And a bonus is that serving always makes this place feel a little smaller. So sign up at our events page or talk to someone in the atrium and get involved today. And those are just the highlights. When you walked in this morning, you should have received a bulletin highlighting everything that happens in the month, like our reoccurring events, such as the gathering for young adults or our mom's group meeting every month. But in the meantime, you can follow along with us on social media, like and subscribe to our YouTube channel, or just visit the Connections Desk any Sunday to get more involved here. Love you guys, bye. So Taylor does such a great job. Give her a round of applause. Guys, so much going on, so much to partake of. Um, hey, I want to thank you guys. I thought Easter was amazing, and you guys made it amazing. First of all, you all got the memo. Uh, we split out evenly in all three services. That was great. People served extra so we could do more children's church and parking ministry. And I met a ton of people who were curious about God, gave out books, had great conversations. So give yourselves a hand for an amazing Easter. I thought... Wow, we really glorify God. Um, someone mentioned this to me in the first service. There's an eclipse tomorrow, right? Now, the next one is in 40 years, so I won't see it. Some of you will, maybe, but uh, I think it's around 317, somewhere around there. But uh, listen, Romans says that the natural man is without excuse because the creation reveals God's glory. There's no excuse, right? Let, I didn't plan this, but... 
Uh, I'm writing a book, Reasons I Believe, 21 Reasons Why I Believe There Definitely Positively Is Without a Doubt a God. And I'm using eclectic things, and one of my reasons for God is the moon. Now, the moon, if you've ever studied the moon, is there, there is no other planet that has our moon or what our moon does. Without our moon, you know about this, the tides, etc. cetera, uh, we'd be covered in water without the moon. And the moon does a hundred other things. That's not why we're here today to talk about the moon. Um, this is what's striking, and you'll see it tomorrow. And, and you see it almost every day at different, at different times of the day. You can put 22 million of our moons in the sun. Think about that. You can put 22 million of our moons in a hollowed out sun. Yet, from our vantage point in the sky, at a certain time, they're the same size. Now you're probably thinking, well, Pastor Bob, that's not a big deal. That's just perspective and, and, and you know, you can make things look like, listen, what are the odds of a planet like ours having the only moon like our moon and then it seems like it was put there so that when we observe it, it would be at the same place uh, in the sky and they would overlap one another. And Genesis tells us God gave us the, the, the sun and the stars and the moon for navigation and seasons, right? What are the odds from our vantage point they would be the same size though the sun is huge and the moon is small? So just another reason to believe in God. It just keeps piling up the evidence. It's just overwhelming. And then man suppresses it. But again, that's not why we're here. Um, Mark chapter 12. Let's open our Bibles. We jumped ahead with the uh, crucifixion and resurrection last week to chapter 15. We're going to dial back. This is Tuesday of Holy Week. Jesus has made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. He's cleansed the temple on Monday. Now it's Tuesday. And it says, they sent some of the Pharisees and some of the Herodians. Now, this is the religious leaders sending to Jesus this contingency of men of these different sects to trap him in his talk. And they came to him and said, teacher, we know that you are true and do not care about anyone's opinion. Some people have said that about me. <laughs> I care about your opinion. For you are not swayed by appearances, but truly teach the way of God. Here's their question. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay them or should we not? But knowing their hypocrisy, right? That was all flattery. Jesus said to them, why put me to the test? Bring me a denarius. That was a Roman coin. And let me look at it. And they brought one and he said to them, whose likeness and inscription is this? Now he knew who it was. It was Tiberius. That was the Caesar during Jesus' life. And they said, it's Caesar's. And Jesus said to them, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God. And it says they marveled at him. <laughs> they marveled at him. Now, five seconds before this, Jesus tells them a parable about a man who owned a vineyard indicting the nation and the religious leaders that they failed in what God had called them to do. And it said they were angry and wanted to arrest him. Now they're marveling at him. And what they're marveling at is the genius of Jesus. This is one of the most profound things Jesus ever said while he was on earth. And um, we're going to talk about Jesus and politics today. Now, I want to start out by saying this. Uh, if you condensed everything Jesus said in all four Gospels, about politics or the politics of his day, this is what you would wind up with, an index card. If you took everything Jesus ever said about politics, everything he ever said about the political climate of his day, this is what you would wind up with. And, it, and it's really strange because as I listen to Christian TV or YouTube or radio, um, you would think that's all Jesus talked about. Because uh, as I live my life, I hear, this is what Jesus would have done, should have done. This is the platform he support. Uh, Jesus was right wing, he was left wing. Like, that's all I hear, and mostly that's putting words in Jesus' mouth. Again, Jesus said very, very few things about politics, and this is one of the times he talked about it, so we're going to talk about it. Now, what Jesus did talk about was the kingdom of God. Um. In all four Gospels, the number one word that came out of Jesus' mouth was Father. 
And it makes all the sense, right? That was the central relationship of his life. That's every, from what everything sprang was his relationship to his Father in heaven. He taught us when we pray, we should say what? Our Father who art in heaven. Isn't that cool? That should be the central relationship in our life. And he paved the way for that. Uh, we learned on Easter, the veil was torn in two, that you and I might boldly come into the throne of grace. We now have a relationship with Almighty God. That is the key to life, guys. That's the key to living. This portal into God's grace and seeing yourself as a child of Almighty God is such a beautiful thing. Second most thing Jesus talked about was the kingdom of God. In the book of Matthew, it's called the kingdom of heaven. They're used interchangeably. We see Matthew used the phrase 33 times. Mark used it 15 times. Remember, Mark is a condensed gospel. Luke, 31 times. Now, John only twice, but John introduces us to the same thing, but but he categorizes it as eternal life, right? This is eternal life that you might know me and the Father that sent me. Of the 34 parables Jesus taught, the majority of them tell us what this kingdom looks like. You know, the kingdom of God is like a man who would scatter seed, right, et cetera, et cetera. These are called kingdom parables mostly found in the gospel of of Luke. When we started Mark a long time ago, chapter 1, verse 14, it says, he, Jesus, came to Galilee preaching the good news of the gospel of the kingdom of God. Jesus came and introduced this realm where God is king, where God is Lord. And then he told us what this kingdom would look like. When he was in the synagogue at Nazareth, he was handed the scroll of Isaiah in Luke chapter 4. He said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel of the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, proclaim liberty to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to preach and proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. He then closed the book, gave it back to the attendant and sat down and all the eyes of those in the synagogue were fixed on him and he began to say to them, today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And you remember what they wanted to do? They wanted to throw him down an embankment because the fulfillment of this was only in the future kingdom of God and Jesus said, I am the one who brings this kingdom. When he taught the Sermon on the Mount, he taught us how to enter this kingdom, what its citizens look like. The Sermon on the Mount is not the Christian Ten Commandments. It's what life looks like in the kingdom of God. The entrance was, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom. For those who would have a poverty of spirit, realizing that apart from God's grace, there would be no entrance into the kingdom, the kingdom would open up to them. And then the characteristics of these people would be a hunger and thirst for righteousness. They become peacemakers, on and on. And listen, they would be persecuted by the dominant kingdom. Jesus came to bring a kingdom, but there are many other kingdoms and many other kings. That's why Satan's temptation was so strong. If you bow down and worship me, I'll give you all the kingdoms of this world. And of course, Jesus refused that. When Jesus healed and cast out demons, he said, if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come. The healings, the the casting out of demons validated that he had brought the kingdom. So one of the top three questions I'm ever asked, and I actually ask it, is, uh, hey, Pastor Bob, uh, Jesus healed, Jesus cast out demons. How come we don't see it in our day? And one of my answers, and I have many reasons, and one of them is because Jesus isn't here. (laughs) Like Jesus brought the kingdom. Now, the kingdom's still here. We'll get into that. But by and large, wherever Jesus came, he brought the kingdom. And the Sermon on the Mount presents to us an upside-down kingdom where the poor are rich and where justice flows like a river, and we can go on and on and on to the kingdom that Jesus said that he would bring. He said the kingdom of God, if you can accept this, is within you. Now, it's not a great translation. I believe the kingdom is within us. What he said is it's in your midst. And Paul takes all of this, that Jesus talked about the kingdom, and it's not on an index card, and he condenses it, and he says this in the book of Romans. He said, 
the kingdom of God is not meat, it's not drink. In other words, he, he, what he's saying, it's not rules and regulations, it's not religious ritual. That has nothing to do with the kingdom, he said, but it's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. The kingdom is something that's available. Jesus said, pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Now, to have a kingdom, you need a king, right? Logically, to have a kingdom, you need a king. Don't think for a minute Jesus got crucified because he healed on the Sabbath or, bro or broke Jewish laws. The Romans could care less about religious laws or religious worship. They were actually very tolerant. They ruled from Rome to the Mediterranean. There were many worship styles, many gods. They had, they had no interest in religion. They had tremendous interest when they heard the word kingdom and kings. And that's what put Jesus on the cross. To have a kingdom, you need a king. Everyone knew that. Most of the world was a monarchy. There was no such thing as limited government, democracy, voting. None of that existed. Jesus was a king. And we're going to talk about his kingdom. Now, the disciples knew this. Heck, the mother of the disciples knew this. One of the requests was, can one of my sons sit on your right hand? Can one of my sons sit in your left hand? Uh, wasn't that hard, right, to see the kingdom in Jesus? A blind man saw it, blind Bartimaeus. On Palm Sunday, Jesus is making his way on the Jericho Road to Jerusalem, and blind Bartimaeus yells out, Jesus is Nazareth, thou son of David. That is a messianic term. That is a term of a king. The thief on the cross knew it. Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He knew Jesus was a king. The, the, on his cross, it said, King of the Jews. Pilate said, are you a king? He said, it is as you say. The wise men who came from the east knew it. Matthew tells us they went to Herod and said, show us he who is born king of the Jews. We have seen his star in the east and we've come to worship him. Now all this was derived from the scriptures. I want to read you Psalm 2. Begins by asking a question, why do the nations rage? <laughs> and we could talk about that for months of Sundays. Why are the nations raging? You know, why did we enter the 20th century with so optimism only to see two world wars, a holocaust? One of the bloodiest centuries. Well, why do the nations rage? Why, why with all this prosperity are nations still raging? The King James Version for that word nation says, why do the heathens rage? And what it opens up is that the only nation that God ever ordained was the nation of Israel. When God called Abraham and said, Abraham, get out of your country. I'm going to take you to a land uh, that I will show you and I will make of you a, a great nation. And then God doubles down. He said, these are the people, right? Stars in heaven, sands on the seashore. And by the way, I'll even give you the geography from, from the great sea, the Mediterranean, all the way to the river Euphrates, et cetera, et cetera. That is the only nation under God, the only nation ever prescribed by God, the only nation God ever made a covenant with. You have to be very careful extrapolating Old Testament scripture where it talks about what God would do for that nation and overlaying it on any other nation. Like my people who are called by name, if they will humble themselves and pray, I will heal their land. Now, please listen clearly. I understand the principle. If revival broke out in America and we humbled ourselves and we cried out to God, I, you know, I think God would do great things and he'd show up, right? That's a wonderful principle. But he's not going to heal our land. Because the only land that ever talked about was the land of Israel. And, and if you don't understand that, you got to go back and read the scripture and figure it out. Why do the nations rage? Why do the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and his anointed? Saying, let us break their bonds in pieces, cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heaven shall laugh. Now, God's not laughing at them. This is, almost, this is almost like when your toddler gets in your car and wants to drive. 
you kind of laugh, like, come on, dude, you're way over your skis here. The Lord shall hold them in derision. He shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. Listen to what God says. I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion, and I will declare the decree the Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance, the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, therefore, be wise, O kings. Be instructed, you judges or rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are those who put their trust in him. And this is why they understood that one day there would be a kingdom, right? This is Christmas. Uh, the virgin shall conceive, bring forth the son, we'll call him wise, counselor, the father, etc., etc. And the government will be upon his shoulders. He, he would be a king. Now the first thing we have to understand is when we talk about this kingdom is that this kingdom was moral and spiritual, not political. The kingdom was moral and spiritual, was not political. We already talked about Israel was the only nation God had ever ordained. Now, to understand what's going on in the text, and I'm sure you've heard this text preached on many times, render to Caesar what is Caesar and to God what is God's. And every time we come away from it, it's like, Okay, um, whatever citizen, as a Christian you are of any country, you should pay your taxes. Now, I'm pretty sure I would have paid my taxes if Jesus never said that. Next week, is it Monday? I don't know. Uh, I'll pay my taxes. Because I don't like the alternative, do you? Like jail? Like, I want to do jail ministry where I go in and come out. I don't want to stay. So I paid my taxes before I knew Jesus. So I didn't need this text to know I should pay my taxes, all right? To understand what's going on here is to understand that they're trying to frame Jesus politically and understand that you have to understand the groups. Now, just like our culture, uh, they had groups they were affiliated with, right? We have Republican, Democrats, we have the Green Party, we're Evangelicals, Catholics, we have all kinds of things, right? So... Here, they sent a delegation of the Pharisees and Herodians. Now, the Pharisees you know, right? Now, you think they're the bad guys. Actually, there was a time where they were the reformed back to the Bible guys. Uh, they believed in literally the word of God. They had a lot of good things going on in this group. The Herodians were sympathizers with Rome. There was another group called the Zealots, one of Jesus' disciples, was a zealot, uh, Simon the Canaanite. There was another group called the Essenes, which said we should pull out of society. They went down the Qumran near the Dead Sea. That's where the Dead Sea Scrolls came from. The Sadducees, they were kind of um, the people that didn't believe in the resurrection or angels, right? So we have all these different parties, and they send this group, the Herodians and the Pharisees, who would never share a meal together, and they come and ask Jesus, the burning question of the day. This was a political football. If there was cable TV back then, there would be two guys that would argue all day about should we pay taxes to Caesar or not. Now, when you look at it, please understand this. Whenever we have a situation like they had, should we pay taxes to Caesar, or the multitude of issues facing us as humanity today, Please understand these are complex issues. Like a yes or no answer doesn't cut it. There's years of history, and, and you got to walk in somebody else's shoes, and there's nuances to all this stuff. But the idea is, should we pay taxes or not? Now, now if Jesus says, yes, pay your taxes, the Pharisees are going to say, everything you've taught about the kingdom of God is a sham. Everything you've taught for three years is a lie. If Jesus says, don't pay your taxes, they're going to run the pilot and say, there's an insurrectionist who's going to mount a rebellion. So Jesus, in his brilliance, says, show me a denarius. Now, did anybody ever wonder why he didn't have one? <laughs> uh, I'll just think about it out loud. Uh, he may not have had it because though he was rich, he became poor. 
Son of man had nowhere to lay his head, etc. And you know, Jesus had a treasurer, and he could call 10,000 of angels. And one time he needed tax money. He told Peter, go down to the sea and see a galley. The first fish will have a coin in his mouth. Like he, he, like he didn't lack was the idea. Is there a chance he didn't have a denarius because it had the inscription and the image of Caesar, and that broke the second commandment? I don't know. But he says, give me a denarius. Now, I was going to ask you all to pull a quarter out of your pocket until I realized this has gone the way of the newspaper and everything else. Like, when's the last time you've ever seen change before? And it's strange to me because I'm one of those kids who would pull all the seat cushions out, scrounging up change. Because for 50 cents, I could get like a pimple ball and play box ball. And for a quarter, I could buy a Coke. And now kids have 5,000 cans of Coke in their pantry from Costco. And so this doesn't mean much anymore, right? So you look at a coin, and you have someone like George Washington on it, and other coins have political figures. And then on the back, it tells you what it's worth, 25 cents, right? I need to talk to you about money for five minutes. I'm going to nerd out. I was an economics major, and and this is going to be germane to the story, so please listen. So we think about money, and we think, okay, money is is a means of exchange because bartering gets complex, right? So if a guy over here raises sheep, and a guy over here has a vineyard, and somebody else is a shoesmith, it gets really hard carrying sheep around, and, and all these items, and bartering back and forth, so money becomes a means for an exchange, and that's true. But that's not how money started. Money started because kings, when they had standing armies that were non-volunteer armies, had to pay soldiers. Soldiers had to go in the foreign lands. They had to buy produce. They 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 had living expenses. So they needed to be paid in form of a salary. So kings came up with this idea to find something that was very rare and couldn't be copied, i.e. gold or silver, And they would put their inscription and their image on it and the amount of money. Now, the image was on there because they owned the money. They owned the gold and the silver. So here's what they would do. They would pay the soldiers in the gold and silver. The soldiers would go into these foreign lands and they would buy provisions. Now, the question is, why would a farmer, a vineyard owner, anyone producing this, why would they receive coins back which seem worthless, right? I would want goods back so I can use them for my family. The reason they would receive coins back is because the government would tax you. This was a head tax. This tax from Rome was the right to be under Roman rule. So the minute the government imposed the tax, guess how the government wanted to be paid? in coinage. They didn't want sheep or goats or anything like that. So now you were willing to exchange your goods for this coin because when tax came due, you had coins to give to the government. That meant that all of money was one giant IOU back to the one who minted it, i.e. Caesar and next week the U.S. government. Now, Jesus says, show me a denarius. Whose image is it? The minute you say image around people that understand the Bible, they're thinking Genesis 127. That God created man in his own image, male and female, he created them. That man was created in the image and likeness of God. That's right where you go right away. Whose image is this? They, They go to the Ten Commandments, have no graven image before me. Whose image is this? And their answer was Caesar. Now, uh, up on the screen, you'll see a denarius, right? By the way, there are thou- you can, there are thousands. You can buy them on eBay. I don't know if you know that. They found so many of these. And you'll see there uh, Caesar. That's his image. And then what would be written on there was the divine Augustus Pontifex Maximus. In other words, he's the supreme Ruler, all authority comes from him. He's divine. He's literally the son of God. That was the inscription. And Jesus said, render to Caesar what is Caesar's and render to God what is God's. 
Now, Jesus didn't answer the question. He didn't answer the question. What, what he said was, whose inscription was on that coin? Caesar's. Well, if that's Caesar's, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. In other words, Caesar really does own all the money. It's an IOU back to him, and if he owns all the money, give him what he wants. Give Caesar what is rightfully his, but then give God what is due him. And Mark here, and this is brilliant, if you look at the verbs here, the verbs change. The question is, what shall we pay? What shall we tribute? What shall we gift Caesar? Should we gift Caesar this money? Jesus changes the verb and says, render. That's an old King James. What it means is, Caesar wants your money, give it to him. It's his money. You're only giving back to him what he gave you. But render, give to God what's due him. And what's due God is your life because you're made in the image of God. That's what is due to God. Your sexuality, your finances, your intellect, your spouse, your children, your career. See, in the Old Testament, you would bring an offering, a turtle dove, a lamb, and the priest would cut it and put it on an altar. But the New Testament says you and I should get up on an altar and become a living sacrifice. We should render to God all that we are. And the reason we render to God all that we are is because God wants to give back all that he is and live in a relationship with you and me. Render to Caesar what is Caesar's and render to God what is God's. They're going to ask him a question a little later in the chapter. Lord, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus is going to go way back to Numbers in the Shema and say, to love the Lord your God with all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind. This is what we teach the kids at Innovate here, that we can love God with our head, hearts, and hands. That the key to human flourishing is really to give God all that you are so that you become all that you were created to be. Seize your, wants your silly money, give it to him. But don't give him anything more, Jesus said. He doesn't have authority over you. He didn't create you. Uh, the only authority he has is from on high. Only give him your money. Don't give him anything more. Don't give him your allegiance. Don't give him your all. Just give him what's due. He didn't talk about how wrong the system was. He didn't talk about how the system should come down. He didn't declare arms against the system. He said, give him what he wants, but give God what's due to him. Jesus basically said, I exist outside of this dominant kingdom. My kingdom's not of this world, he told Pilate. He never really answered their question. He never said you couldn't be patriotic. He never said you shouldn't be involved in government. He never said we shouldn't be good citizens. He never said any of that. But what he was saying is, this weekend... I'm about to start a revolution that will change the world for 2,000 years that no government could possibly do. I'm going to bring a kingdom that will change hearts and lives for all time. And when Jesus died on that cross and rose again, he started the greatest revolution the world's ever seen. With no armies and no edicts. And I look at it and I think, it, you know, the Bible tells us that had the demons known what was about to happen, they would never crucify the Lord of glory because Jesus gets up on Resurrection Sunday and then 120 people are in the upper room on the day of Pentecost and now there's not one Jesus, there's 120 and then there's 3,000 and 5,000 and here we go. And they turn the world upside down and in 300 years, Rome would, it wouldn't fall but Christianity would emerge. They wouldn't become a Christian nation, but Christianity would have its way in that nation. The Western world would be created, and we would see one revolution of justice, one revolution of mercy, one revolution of human rights, one after another, not because of any political agenda, but because human hearts and minds were transformed by the power and the glory of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And what we need to understand is whenever you and I go somewhere, we bring the kingdom with us. 
We bring it in the schools. We bring it in institutions and boardrooms. We bring it into locker rooms. That's why we were to pray, Lord, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And you look at every facet of history. You look at slavery in the United States and the emergence of the black church, and that's a revolution that Jesus created. You look at the Jesus revolution in Calvary Chapel, Jesus created. You can look all through history. The idea, pockets of America, Jesus revolution, goes on and on and on. Small band of followers would spread this gospel universally. Now, there's another thing we have to understand. The kingdom, moral and spiritual, it's not political, is now and it's not yet. So for those who have spiritual eyes to see, we can see the kingdom of God, right? We can see God's activity in the world. We have spiritual eyes and spiritual ears. There is a dominant kingdom. There are other kingdoms going on. But we can see God's activity. But it's not in its fullness. See, Jesus said, my, I, my kingdom's not of this world or my soldiers would fight. He also talked about a coming kingdom. When he finally would sit on the right hand of the, of, of the throne of God and, and justice would cover the earth. And you can read scriptures in Isaiah and all the prophets. I was on the phone this weekend with Ryan Reese. Ryan's been here a bunch of times. He leads the Whosoever Ministry. They're on a year-long tour where they go into public schools. And it's unbelievable. They've done all the research on legality. And they go to these public schools. And right after school, on the public school property, in gymnasiums, and, and I wish I could, I, I should have brought all the pictures for you, they pack these, these public schools with kids after school, on property, public school property, preach the gospel, thousands of kids come forward. That's the kingdom of God going forward. People being set free. Erwin McManus, in his book, The Genius of Jesus, said, what would you do if you found out you had all the power in the universe? <laughs> Love to sit around and talk about this. What would you do if you had all the power in the universe? What would be your first act to demonstrate your power? John tells us this is exactly the position in which Jesus found himself near the end of his ministry. He reminds us that there came a point when Jesus understood that all power and authority had been given to him. Having known that, he then tied a towel around his waist grabbed a water basin, and took a knee. As uncomfortable as it made his disciples, Jesus began to wash their feet. This is what Jesus did with his power. He took the posture of a servant. He chose to die for those who would choose to kill him. He remained faithful to those who would betray him. He offered forgiveness to those who would offer only condemnation. He healed the sick, even though it meant that he would forever carry the wounds of his execution. He tied a towel around his waist to serve those who would later claim no ties to him. To serve the world in a way that cost him everything. On the cross he looked powerless, yet the world had never seen such a demonstration of power. Jesus turned the world upside down when it came to power. He, it was a genius that, in, that eluded all the intellects of his day. How could they have known that power would never know its full force until it was used on the behalf of others? How could they have understood that it is not beneath God to serve? That is exactly like God to serve. If we ever want to know the power of God, we must fully embrace the heart of God. God is the greatest servant who ever lived. There are no feet too dirty for God to wash. There is no life too broken for God to heal. No soul too dark for God to forgive. What does this mean? have to do with power? Who would ever see this as an act of power? Who else but Jesus could make this choice? This is what power looks like in the hands of God, and this is what power looks like in the hands of a genius. And the Bible says, you are in God's hands. And one day, he will be in power. There will be no dominant kingdom. 
and the world we're fighting so hard for will become a reality. And it doesn't mean we don't fight for it. Again, we bring the kingdom. We bring justice. Wherever we go, we should fight for all these things. But one day he's going to bring it in totality. Guys, please listen to me. When the Bible speaks of nations, they're called beasts in the book of Daniel because that's what they are. In the book of Revelation, we're going to see a final confederation of kingdoms run by the beast or the Antichrist or whatever you want to call him. His number is 666. It's very important for this reason because that's the way Satan looks at you and me. He reduces you to a number. And you know how God looks at you? Every hair on your head is numbered. Because he designed you and made you in his image for a reason and loves you with a love that you could never understand. The Bible says the kingdoms of this world one day will be the kingdoms of our God, but not yet. Not yet, but one day. And with that in mind, I want to enter into communion. I want to enter a time, first of the month, we do it first of the month, where we look at this king and the kingdom we've entered and how we've entered and the one who came to serve us. As the ushers come and pass the elements, I want you to think of how you were brought into the kingdom. I want you to, as the Bible says, examine your hearts, let the Holy Spirit examine your hearts. The worship team will play a song over us. The Bible says as often as we do this, we remember the Lord's death until he comes again, until he brings that glorious kingdom. So as the ushers serve you, let's sing together. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you that you've come to meet with us. We thank you that we can join the church of the last 2,000 years and demonstrate that you died for us and you're coming again through this ritual. And Lord, we long to commune with you in Jesus' name. Amen.
Let's all stand and we'll take together. I want you to look at the bread. It's always a reminder that we were far from God, but his mind was always on us. Jesus willingly went to the cross. He said, my body will be broken for you. It's by grace that we entered. It's by grace that we're going to get there. Father, we thank you for this bread. We thank you that we are one loaf. We thank you that man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. God, when we take part of this bread, we are part of every kindred, every tribe, every tongue, everyone who's ever confessed. And one day we'll sit with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob with the redeemed company. And until that time, we take now and we eat of this bread in Jesus' name. Amen. The cup is a reminder that without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. That no one's good enough. No one has done enough is the idea that Jesus paid it all. That's why there's victory in Jesus. And that one day we'll drink it new with him in the kingdom. I want you to leave here refreshed, renewed, as Paul said, leaving those things behind that lay in the past. Pressing on to the high mark and calling of Jesus Christ. This blood forgave us of all of our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us. As you drink now, leave the past behind. Let's drink together in Jesus' name. The Bible says after communion, they sang a hymn. However, they didn't have children's ministry, so uh, if you have children, you need to go get them. The rest of you can sing this. God bless everyone. Fellowship doesn't end here. It extends out into the table to the lawn. Uh, God bless you all. We'll see you next time.